Welcome everyone to the Startup Day here in Chicago. Uh, my name is Mackenzie Kosit, and I'm the Global Startup Evangelist for Amazon Web Services. Uh, to give you a little background about myself, uh, I worked at a lot of enterprises for many years, and then back in about 2011, started to work for um, some pretty large startups in New York City, helping to build and grow those. Uh, so my, this works. So uh, you know, back in 2011, I, I joined Tumblr. Uh, I was one of the early engineers there, helping to grow and scale that. So on physical machines, trying to grow that to about 20 billion page views a month. Uh, doing that on physical hardware, I don't recommend anyone ever try that again. Uh, much easier ways to do that now. Um, uh, Tumblr was, of course, acquired by Yahoo uh, around 2013. I got really interested in the healthcare space. So one of the first engineers over at Oscar, and I ran a lot of the engineering teams, helping to build um, really the first insurance company entirely on AWS from scratch. We did that in about three months. Uh, so I ran a lot of the security, database, IT, SRE teams there. Um, working in the healthcare space, I got kind of a, a weird obsession and love for working in compliant industries. So uh, FinTech was, of course, the next, next natural fit for me. So I moved over to Betterment, ran some teams there, and uh, Betterment is the world's largest independent robo-advisor with about $10 billion in assets under management. Um, but shifting over to AWS has been really my favorite role so far. Um, the reason is I get the opportunity to work with a wide number of startups around the globe. Um, and this is just a subset of the many startups who are building today using AWS. And it covers every imaginable segment. So uh, of course, you, you can look at companies like Airbnb who are using it to really you know, change the way that we think about hospitality. You have companies like Harry's who, you know, the Razor company, took their original uh, funding and used it to purchase a $130 million Razor factory in Germany and now are building and distributing these globally. Um, really, you know, Imager, of course, for hosting images and, and supporting Reddit's uh, uh, you know, image and media. You can name any industry out there, and there's going to be some startups all over the world who are really changing those by building on top of AWS. In fact, there's more startups who are building and launching on Amazon than any other provider in the world. Now, from an engineering perspective, what's really interesting to me is, is seeing how startups have changed the way they've built over time and how that kind of correlates to how cloud has evolved over the past 10 plus years. So this slide uh, is kind of, it, it shows you the number of releases uh, year over year uh, at AWS. So last year, in 2017, we launched 1,400 new services and features. Each one of these services or features is an easier, quicker, faster way to do something that used to be a complicated task. Um, to demonstrate that, I mean, let's, let's kind of think back to 2008. When if you want to build a, a startup back then or work on any type of project, of course you need some kind of data, a database. So to give a very simple example of this, back then a database meant that <laughs> You had a dedicated team to do that. There's a very, it's a very complicated cluster to set up and maintain. You have bin log replication. You have uh, clusters and sharding. You have um, backups. You have to make sure those are tested, those work. It's a lot of headache and a lot of heavy lifting. And RDS really changed that, right? Uh, now we just take it for granted, essentially, that you can just click a button, have a cluster up, and you work on the next problem, next task. This same type of simplicity that was brought to the databases back in 2009 that's been applied throughout your entire stack um, with all of these new services and features. So along the bottom, I've marked kind of some of my personal favorite milestones. Um, and so another, another one to think about is, you know, 2012, I went to a talk at Velocity, and one of my favorite talks was seeing a very large social media uh, company talking about how they built an entire system for doing real-time processing of messaging. And at the scale they were operating at, it was incredible. It took this team months, and it was a really cool talk. Well, a lot of our customers and a lot of companies saw this and said, we want to be doing that. We can't do real-time processing of it. You know, can AWS help with this? And of course, we had stuff internally we're working on, and we ended up releasing that as Kinesis in 2013. And to show you how people are leveraging uh, like a service such as Kinesis, um, a company who saw that and was like, that's a perfect solution to a problem we're facing today is Supercell. And if you're unfamiliar with Supercell, it's one of the largest gaming companies. They're based out of the Nordics. They're actually acquired by Tencent for, I think, just north of about $8 billion. 
um, but very small team of about 180 engineers today, or 180 people total in the company. Um, Supercell uh, has many games. One of them is Clash of the Clans. It's, it's still one of the top rated games in the, uh, the Apple Store, or the App Store, I should say. Um, and it's basically a, a real-time multiplayer game where uh, you, know, you have all these little units that are, you know, that hit points and damage points, and you're basically tracking all this data. It's all being generated, and it had to be processed in real time. So they looked at it and they said, okay, yeah, we could build this our own team, or we could start using Kinesis instead. So one engineer was able to take that and stand up an entire Kinesis uh, cluster and be able to handle about 45 billion events coming in every day. Um, this number is actually outdated. It's about two years old, so it's grown a tremendous amount since then. Um, and they've architected even new ways to handle this type of, of traffic and volume. So it's great talks online if you want to take a look at that. But it's a great example of um, if you look at their next biggest competitor who um, must really hate candy because they go around crushing it, uh, that company has over 1,400 employees. So here you have a small company, 180, who's able to just focus on building a better game, a better experience for their customer because they're not managing the underlying infrastructure. Um, another great example of this is you know, uh, containerization and uh, finding ways to, to dockerize and deploy this and maintain these uh, images, so these Docker containers. Um, in uh, a company who was trying to find a way to really simplify and standardize their, their environment by leveraging containerization was a company called um, Segment. So Segment's a company, company out of uh, San Francisco. Um, they're just under 300 employees. And what they do is uh, they, if you have an application, uh, you have a lot of data that's being generated about how users are using this app. All sorts of interesting stuff about um, you know, user behavior that you want to be looking at and analyzing and understanding. And so what you do, typically when you're building one of these apps, is you start leveraging all sorts of third-party services because you don't want to build it in-house, right? You want to just start getting up and going. And what happens over time is all these new APIs and libraries and different ways you're sending this data to all different backend systems, well, that pretty soon gets to be a pretty daunting list to maintain. Um, and you're constantly updating these libraries and, and uh, it's, it ends up actually impacting potentially load time of the application because you have to have all these different services that you're sending this traffic to. So Segment said, well, what if we just simplify that and customers could just send us the data once and then we can push and shift that data to whatever backend system that person needs, whether it's analytic systems, warehouses, uh, uh, email campaigns, any type of backend system. Why I like talking about Segment is here's a startup that is very small in scale in terms of employees, but their customers aren't just other companies the same size that they are. Their customers are large enterprises who have tremendous amounts of volume. So they have to handle that scale. Um, you know, reliability and consistency of data delivery and, and there's a lot that goes in there that enterprises demand and you have to do this at a large, large um, scale. It's, it's generally a pretty big challenge. So why do I tell these stories? It all kind of goes back to one common theme. Heavy lifting that stands between your idea and that success. And he's not talking about just Amazon. We experience this at the scale and size we are, but this happens at any, sta any stage of a company. Um, anytime you have a great idea, there's a lot of this, you know, with the AWS. Uh, you can think of this undif undifferentiated heavy lifting as, you know, regardless of what company you have, regardless of what product you're building, we all need databases, we all need servers, we all need networking, we all need, we all need these core components. And so that's in no way a competitive differentiator. Anytime you're focused on that and not on your product, other companies are focused on their product and, letting, and leveraging these managed services. They're, the short story of that is if it, your customers in the end don't care what your clusters look like. The good news is that a lot of this undifferentiated heavy lifting uh, is covered by many of the services. So we have over 125 services that are built specifically to tackle these types of tasks. So, covering everything from maybe you want to start building an augmented reality app for your, for your uh, company. You, know, there, you can start leveraging Sumerian for that. Maybe you're curious about doing something in the IoT space. We have a whole IoT platform that uh, handles uh, events and actions and, and, and device uh, registration and uh, certificates on those devices. 
Maybe you want to build a voice or chat you know, interface for your product. Well, you can start using you know, uh, Amazon Lex, which is the same brain and, and service that uh, Amazon Alexa is built on top of. So it's opened up for you as a developer to play with uh, and start building your own chat and uh, voice interfaces with. So all of these services are here um, to really get your product to market much quicker. One of the, the biggest pitfalls I see from early stage companies is uh, people come in and they say, ah, there's a problem. I know how to solve this. I've solved this before in the past. I'm doing it with the best, cheapest, most efficient um, services available. You know, these are here to help you. Uh, so first round did a really great um, survey trying to understand why a lot of early stage startups fail. And it's no surprise that 40% uh, of them it ended up just being your burn rate getting too high. And so if you think about well, where do people spend a lot of their money as an early stage company, or actually any startup really? Uh, it generally falls into these, these main buckets and categories. You have people, infrastructure, marketing, vendors. When I say office, I'm not talking about the office product. Those licensing does get expensive, but uh, actual physical offices. Um, the great thing about AWS is we really help in these first two main areas. Um, so by having more cost-effective infrastructure, you ex effectively extend your runway there. By having infrastructure that takes less people to maintain, you need to hire less developers and less engineers to accomplish what used to take many more uh, people to do in the past. And that's why over the past you know, uh, 10 plus years, We've seen a real shift. So in 2005, you know, to get an idea off the ground, you'd, take, you'd need millions of dollars. I'd go towards racking servers, building a team of engineers, getting that all up and ready, just so you can start the, the development, and then months later, you can actually get that code out and get that product in the hands of your customers. Today, we're seeing single-person teams with just thousands of dollars and deploying uh, a product in a matter of weeks. It's a true testament to this is, this is how um, you know, powerful these services are if you leverage them. Do you have any idea of kind of what this looks like? I, I want to kind of compare what a startup's able to do today versus what they're able to do back in 2010. I could compare this to, you know, startup on building entirely in cloud versus data center, but that's way too easy. So I want to just say this is this is what a startup would, would have been would have been doing back in 2010 if they're building and what that looks like um, in today. So. A goal for any early stage startup is just getting your MVP out there. Uh, we all understand that. You want to get in the hands, get feedback, and start iterating on that as quickly as possible. So time to market is always super important. Well, day one for a startup in 2010, that's, of course, your focus. Um, you're likely manually provisioning these, service, uh, these servers. You just want to get a server up, get the code deployed, and work on it. It's probably a manual deploy process. You're copying some tar file across and, and manually you know, restarting stuff. Uh, you don't really have much monitoring because you don't have many users. So you're going to get to that when you get to that point. Um, you're probably deploying a couple times a week. And to get some dev to understand this whole you know, bespoke process might take a couple weeks before they feel comfortable with this uh, environment. So then a year goes by, and uh, uh, you know, you've, you're now focused a lot on productivity. You have more people joining as engineers. You start leveraging infrastructure as code because you're, you don't want to have this drift in your configuration. You start focusing on automation and scaling this. You might set up a CI CD pipeline. Um, this is roughly the, um, let's say, yeah, you, you now are going to be focusing more on monitoring to have users who are now depending on your service. You're deploying a little more often. Maybe you can onboard an engineer in a week so they understand all the pieces and components of your, serv of your, of your product and your, your environment. And then by year two, you're finally like up and going. You're running at full speed. You're now focused on growth and adding more users. You have all, all the automated systems in place. You have great automated deploy processes. Maybe you're leveraging Cuba and doing chat ops based deployments. That's great. You have super in-depth alerting and monitoring that's just escalating to the right people. You're doing tons of deploys a day, and you can onboard somebody within a few days who understands how all your different systems work. And so that's kind of the goal, you, and if you talk to companies back then and ask them, you can kind of bucket them into these general categories. Um, but this is the ultimate goal at the end, was you want a super productive engineering team who's pushing code out and understands how all these systems work, and they're not doing stuff by hand anymore. If you had graphed this out, this is basically what it looked like. You'd be hiring more engineers, you should, be develop, you should be pushing out more code, and your onboarding time should be going down over time. If you're hiring more engineers and you're not pushing out more code, then 
I want to ask why you're hiring engineers and, and, and what they're doing at that point. So this should always kind of be a general goal, right? More developers, more productivity, less onboarding time, uh, more sharing of knowledge of, of, of how people work in your environment. Well, keep in mind that we've been working with startups, not just startups, but also enterprises for 11 years. So every time a company in any industry says, hey, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to solve a specific problem and I'm hitting this, this challenge. We're spending a lot of time spinning wheels on, on uh, you know, maybe it's scaling a specific service, maybe it's uh, updating or patching a specific um, part of their infrastructure or, or a part of their mobile app that, that uh, the testing piece of it is a little challenging. And so we constantly are listening to what customers are telling us and we just build that and put it back in the hands of everybody. So that's what creates all of this. And so if you were a startup in 2018 and you asked me, well, how should I begin? What should I start doing? I have nothing built today. What's the quickest way to get something up and going? I'd say, all right, well, let me show you what you can do as a startup in 2018 with AWS. On day one, you can get to all of this and do it in just a matter of minutes. So for those who um, aren't aware, we launched last year a service called CodeStar. And CodeStar wraps a lot of our um, really battle-tested services, um, development environments with cl uh, Cloud9, uh, code build, code deploy, uh, and it allows you to quickly take an application you have and deploy it in the type of infrastructure that you're looking to run it in. So give you an idea of what that looks like. When you go to CodeStar, you get a listing that says, what type of app are you trying to run? Are you trying to run a PHP app? Uh, do you want to deploy it in Elastic Beanstalk? Do you have a Python app or a Fla you know, Flask? Do you want to run that uh, on EC2? You pick the type of application you have and how you want to run it. And when you deploy it, it takes about five minutes to go through the process. You point it at your, uh, your source code repository. You get a whole dashboard. And this dashboard is now set up. As soon as a commit happens within that repository, it's going to start kicking out uh, an automatic build. You can start doing testing in there. There's, there's pre-built tests in place. You can add load testing in there. It'll deploy it out. Um, and you have one place where you can have a run book of, of how you'll put notes on there about any specific things that the team needs to know about. You can see commit history over time. You can see monitoring about that application or service. So this dashboard is something that companies would strive to get to and build, spending years doing it. And today, startups building get that within a matter of a few minutes. So if you haven't looked at CodeStar, I highly recommend looking at it because it's, just, it's such a quick shortcut to going from nothing to a fully robust CICD pipeline, testing, monitoring, uh, fully, fully ready to go for you. So um, super powerful. It's because of services like these that startups should be able to build quicker, faster, cheaper, and more reliably than ever before. Um, but that brings us to Startup Day. So, um, you know, I want to give you a little background on what Startup Day is. You know, there are, um, there are all sorts of unique challenges that you're going to face building. And one of the best ways to learn is to hear how other people are, are solving these. So the idea behind Startup Day is let's take, um, or let's get some of the best talent and companies who have gone through this already, have built products, um, have, have felt pains and figured out ways to engineer around it, and get them to share their stories about what they're building, how they did it, and provide this guidance back to you. So today, we have um, a pretty packed agenda of some great speakers. So we have uh, the CTO in from Bustle, uh, who's going to be presenting next. Um, we have Haas Alert, talking about uh, cellular to everything, which is C2X. Uh, you know, we have, um, we have Uptake, talking about how they approach data engineering at their startup. Um, uh, Tempest is here talking about building in the compliance and regulatory space and how to approach security and how they think about it. And then Innova talking about how they're doing automated retraining of their models using SageMaker. So it's a wide range of everything from serverless to um, philosophical approaches to data engineering to uh, machine learning uh, and more. Uh, so for those who have never used Slido, uh, the way that um, we want to engage with the whole audience is uh, Slido, if you load this up in your phone now, um, it will be the way that you can ask questions all through our presentations. And it allows people to upvote and say, hey, this question is relevant to me. I really want to hear this question answered. Because um, you want to make sure that the questions that we address are um, the most seeked out ones by, by you. 
So uh, definitely load this up on your phone, slide sli.do slash startup day. And also for everyone watching on Twitch, uh, we're also going to be fielding your questions this way. Um, so please keep it loaded and, and use it for asking questions. Um, another great resource that a lot of people uh, don't realize it exists is the AWS Startup Blog. This is interviews that's happening with entrepreneurs and founders from around the world. So you can hear about what people are building, um, what's unique about their markets and industries. There's, uh, there's guest engineering blog posts, uh, how people are architecting, uh, all sorts of interesting solutions. So definitely check that out. And so we have Startup Centrals are happening at most of our uh, summits around the globe now. And these are not just a hub for startups to go and network and meet other people, but also lightning talks are happening. So here, for example, is our San Francisco summit from last year. And it's uh, one of the engineers from Mapbox talking about how they're processing petabytes of uh, mapping data um, using ECS. So uh, definitely, if you go to a summit, um, check out the Startup Central. It's built there for um, you in mind. Um, just think about where you're spending that time, right? Your, your, your customers don't care about um, how automated a certain piece of your infrastructure is. They care that your product's available and it's ready for them. All this innovation um, is all about just building a better customer experience and building a trust. And by taking care of your customers, it's also being really um, aware of protecting that data. So we have all sorts of security offerings, things like Macy that will automatically um, identify uh, sensitive information, flag it for you. There's, there's all sorts of tools that exist that are there to help you protect your customer's data. Um, so I, I don't care what industry you're in, you should always be putting security first. So take care of your customers, because if you lose the trust of your customers, then you've, uh, as it says, you'll have innovated for nothing. Um, so to kick off our first speaker and presenter, uh, I'd like to welcome Tyler, uh, CTO of Bustle. So let's give him a round of applause. Come on up. Hi, 